I hope now you have a better understanding of what we mean when we say there is risk and uncertainty. Um, we had the high-level overview where I was talking about maybe trying to estimate how many of these we would sell per month. And then we had the oil and gas video on trying to estimate how much a project might cost. It's exactly the same idea. What I'd like to do now is maybe get to a question that's entering many of your minds, which is, okay, fine. I think I understand once I see what the range estimate for the uncertainty looks like, I think I understand the concepts. But how do we get that range estimate in the first place? How do we actually go about trying to establish how many of these we might sell. And I think perhaps a good way to do this is to contrast the standard method, what I see a lot of, versus what I would recommend is a far better technique, which is a, a variant of something called the Delphi technique mixed with something called the Beta technique. So let me first of all talk about a classic way of trying to estimate how many of these we might sell. Does this story ring tr true? Um, the CEO calls a meeting, invites all of, uh, all of the regional sales managers into the meeting. Maybe there's some product specialist in there also. And you have a meeting, and the CEO at the beginning of the meeting says, our job is to come up with a number on how many of these things we think we're going to sell because we have to buy the equipment for our factory and we have to write our supply chain contracts. So at the end of this meeting, I want to know what the planning number is for how many of these we're going to sell. Then what typically happens is the CEO calls in the data guy and says, data guy, tell me, the last time we introduced a product like this, how many did we sell? And the data guy goes through and crunches numbers and says, 100,000. And maybe the data guy has some sales figures on what competitors are doing. Data guy, how many of these types of things does our competitor sell? Uh, 80,000. Data guy, um, can you go do a, a regression analysis against how many sales there are out there and last time we sold, introduced something new versus our competitive position and come up with a data number? And the data guy does all that. And let's say the data guy's final number on all this is 100,000. Now the CEO goes around the room and says, OK, it looks like the data says we're going to sell 100,000 of this per month. What do you guys have to say about that? Joe, Bill, Sue, what do you think of a number? Can you, do you agree with this? Should we move along? Can we use this number? Bill, Sue, whoever, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, do I want to go against the data? And they're going to probably say, hmm, the data says 100,000. I'm going to look foolish if I disagree with the data and say 20,000 because I think it looks terrible or 200,000 because I think it's a hit. So I'm just going to go ahead and go with the data. That's one of the problems with the standard method. As soon as you bring data into the conversation, it tends to reduce outliers. Remember that. Data is something that a colleague and friend of mine who's a professor at UT named John Daly calls a God term. God terms are terms that we're not allowed to argue with in the context of this environment. So if data becomes a God term, then as soon as somebody invokes data, it becomes very difficult to argue against it. That's an important point. Let's have that same story again, and let's modify it a little bit. Again, I'm the CEO, and I want to predict how many of these we're going to sell. I start the meeting. All of my regional sales managers are here, and uh, data guy is here. I also have some technical people. I come in and I go, data guy, based on your analysis, how many of these do we think we're going to sell? 100,000. And then I, as the CEO, go, OK, data guy, thank you very much. I think this is better than our regular product. The data suggests 100,000. I think it's 120,000. What do you all think of that? Do you think that 120,000 is a good planning number for this? Bill, Joe, Sue, what do you think? Tell me about 120,000. We're back to a similar problem. 
power has spoken in the room. The person who holds the most power has stated an opinion at the beginning. That opinion, even more powerfully, comes from a God term called data. It becomes very difficult for other people in the room to argue against what the power has said about this. It's almost certain that data in combination with anchoring by the power is going to throw out almost all outliers and we're going to reach a consensus very close to the number of 120,000. Remember that. That's another problem. Power tends to exclude outliers. Let's play this a couple more times because I want to show you the standard problems that arise every time you're trying to predict something in the future. We've got data as a God term. We've got the power speaking. You ever been in a meeting where the person who knows a lot about something, maybe a technical person, maybe an engineer or a technical person of some type, and when they say things, they say things calmly and they say things um, without hyperbole. And have you ever been in that room where you have the salesperson, the person who's very gregarious, the person who knows how to use words to make arguments? They may not know as much about what they're talking about as this other person, but they're much more effective with their words. That's another problem that commonly arises in here. Suppose we go back to the scenario and I'm the CEO again, and instead of anchoring, or maybe even not having to anchor on me, we're just gonna anchor on the data, I now ask Joe, Bill, and Sue what they think. And imagine that Joe is a very quiet, contemplated, introverted, but very smart person who really knows this market. Whereas Bill is a gregarious, very good talker. And Bill says, you know what, data man, that 100,000, I think that's wrong. I think it's 150,000 because I've been talking to my people and they love this stuff. The other guy says, but I think that we have to be conservative because this isn't that much of a revolutionary ste step out and um, I think we should plan on a more conservative number. Nonsense. This is a home run. I'm telling you, boss, this is a home run. Pretty soon, this kind of conversation can go the way of the most persuasive person in the room rather than necessarily the most knowledgeable person in the room. That, plus many other factors, create what we're going to call groupthink. When we're trying to estimate the future, almost inevitably, if you're not careful and guard specifically against it, Almost for certain, data plus power plus persuasiveness plus the desire to not be seen as an outlier will cause the group to consense around a number in a form of groupthink without really challenging the boundaries. And that creates a problem. What do we do if the outcome of this meeting says, we have reached consensus and the consensus is 35,000 units per month. The same as the number I used in my example earlier. This is the mu, the P50. All right, so we've now agreed upon 35,000 units per month. Here's the problem we have. All of the groupthink problems have eliminated outliers, eliminated outliers, plus we have the problem that I don't even know what the range is. When you say 35,000 a month, Let's consider two scenarios, scenario A and scenario B. Okay, I'm gonna draw range estimates using those ideas we talked about earlier. And in both range estimates, I'm gonna make the P50 or the expected number equal to 35,000 units a month. Now I have a question for you. Suppose in scenario A, there was very little uncertainty. That is, the range estimate was narrow. And what we had is we had a picture that looks something like this using a range estimate. And suppose in scenario B, there was much more uncertainty. That is, the range estimate was much wider. And thus we had a picture that looks something like this. Now some of you are going to ask, why did he draw that one tall and that one short? Remember, whenever you're drawing a range estimate, the total area equals one. 
So if something is taller because it's shorter, something that's wider has to be shorter because the entire area between those two needs to be the same. Now, given that, let me ask you a question just as a practical business perspective. If you believe your 35,000 falls in an uncertainty range as shown in scenario A, would that lead to a different set of management decisions than if you believe your 35,000 falls in a range estimate as in scenario B? You have to write contracts. Suppose you're going to purchase a lot of materials and you're going to guarantee volumes. If you have scenario A and you're relatively sure of the volumes, that is, it's a narrow uncertainty, you would probably be more likely to guarantee volumes. You'd probably drive for lower per unit costs in exchange for guaranteeing volumes and paying a penalty if you don't deliver them. You might be more willing to make investments in um, very expensive equipment because you can almost certainly utilize that equipment. Contrast that with if scenario B turns out to be correct. If I were making a decision in scenario B and I had to write those contracts, I would write contracts that traded off guaranteed volumes against price. I would probably be willing to pay a higher per unit price in order to not have to guarantee as high of volumes because I am less sure of my volumes in that circumstance. Or if you will, I might be willing to do a phased approach to my investment for factory equipment. It could be low, so I'm going to start out by buying just a little bit of equipment, see whether things work out, and then buy more equipment. All I'm trying to say with this example, you may have other examples, is that it's important to know, even if you do have an accurate single number, is it an accurate single number within this kind of uncertainty range estimate, or is it an accurate single number within this kind of range estimate? Because I believe you would do different things. You would make different management decisions between these two scenarios. Therefore, at some fundamental level, the entire example that I gave you, estimating how many of these are going to be sold, is completely flawed. Groupthink, caused by, again, over-reliance on data, consensus around power, persuasion, the desire to not be seen as an outlier. All of that is, first of all, going to tend to make your number very conservative. Secondly, you're going to tend to throw out outliers. And thirdly, even more important than either of those two issues, you don't know what the range looks like because you only have a single number. How might we do this better? Well, we could use the Delphi beta technique. So let me describe it to you. Delphi beta. This is actually a combination of two different techniques, each trying to address part of the problems we just discussed. So let's go back and go through the process of trying to estimate the sales of this pen again. But this time, we're going to try to guard against groupthink, consensus around power, over-reliance on data, lack of desire to be seen as an outlier. We're going to try to protect against those things. And at the same time, we're also going to try to express the range rather than a single number. That's why it's called the Delphi Beta Technique. To do this, the starting point is to remember what we just talked about with respect to describing uncertainty. I'm going to draw an uncertainty diagram with respect to selling these pens. And I'm going to assume it has some skew. So I'm going to assume that the nature of the uncertainty has some kind of distribution that looks like this. It's called a Delphi beta because the generic form of this curve is a beta distribution. And I'm going to be trying to pinpoint three pieces of data, or three numbers for this. Remember. A was the pessimistic or the low end. There was a 5% chance of less. Remember, M was the most likely not to be confused with mu. It's not the 50-50 chance. It's the highest point of the curve. And remember that B was the optimistic, 5% chance of higher, 95% chance of lower. I'm going to use this model of uncertainty to help guide me when I'm estimating the sales of these pens. So how would this new conversation go? All right, 
Let's talk about data. Data is an important thing. Data is a God term. Uh, technically trained people, which many of you are, technically trained people don't like to guess. They like to make decisions based on data. But I want you to remember this whenever you're making a decision based on data. Data can be very useful if, and only if, the environment in which we currently find ourselves is quite similar to the environment under which the data was taken. So, if we have data on the last time sales were made like this, and the general economy, the general acceptance of the technology, the, the marketing presence, the customer demand for products like this was similar, then the fact that in the past the data said we sold X thousand probably has relevance to the fact of how many we're going to sell this time. But if today is materially different than it was in the past when we took the data, sometimes data is not only not very useful, it's actually harmful because it anchors you as to the way the world was when the data was taken, and human intelligence is often better. We can, we can observe that the world is different. We can modify our understanding of what we think the world is because we have a human brain. I'm gonna give you an example of this. As I told you, I've been working a lot in the oil and gas industry. If you go back and you look at large capital projects in the oil and gas industry from about 2004 to about 2009, you're going to notice a very interesting fact. Large capital projects were horrible during that period. Virtually every major capital project above $1 billion US way overran its budget, way overran its schedule. And you couldn't really pinpoint the exact reason by saying a so-and-so company did a bad job. It turns out that for cost and schedule of these projects, we had been looking back at data from the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And we said, the data says it costs this much to do this kind of work. The data says it takes this long to do this kind of work. The only problem is 2004 to 2008 represented a time in the world where oil was at some of the highest prices they had ever been. Therefore, many projects were on the books. At one time it was estimated that we did not have enough capability to do one-fourth the projects that were actually on the books at that time in the oil and gas industry. So this was a time of great expansion, huge oil prices, lots of projects that were viable. The problem was we were looking at data from the late 1990s. We're talking $20 oil, $30 oil, virtually no projects being undertaken. Those projects that were being undertaken having multiple bidders for everything fighting to stay in business. That data was worse than useless because it anchored us to costs and schedules that were reflective of the period under which the data was taken and it did not reflect the environment we were finding ourselves today. China growing, India growing, Brazil growing, Russia growing. And that's what I want you to remember. Data can be helpful, but it can be very dangerous. So our technique has got to be a way to guard against over-reliance on data. We also have to avoid power, groupthink, all those other things. So let's do that scenario again. Here's what I would suggest you might do. I'm the CEO. I call my team into play, same team as before. First thing I do is I say, guys, I want to have an open discussion. I don't want to anchor on any numbers right now, so I don't want to bring the data in. I want to talk about what you think might happen with respect to this pen. Who thinks that this is a revolutionary pen? We have some of the designers here. We have some of the marketing folks. Can you tell us a little bit about this pen and what makes it similar to products we've offered in the past and what makes it distinctly different? Why you think it might be different? Then we would hear from them. And then I would know my audience and I would ask, okay, I would first of all, let's start by thinking about the optimistic outcome. Everybody out there, given the information you've heard, given your own experience, how good do you think this could be? What could the number be? And I want to hear everybody. Yes, I know that you're very persuasive. Yes, you're very good at that. And I understand your argument. But will you hang on for a minute and let me hear what other people are saying out there. What do I think? 
oh, I'm not going to tell you what I think yet because I don't want you to accept my numbers. I want to hear what you have to think first. I would propose something like that, where you're making sure that all of the voices are heard and you're explicitly guarding against some of the things I talked about. And then I go, okay, we don't have to come to consensus around a single number. We've talked about it. We see the range. We see the possible high ends. Now I'd like to talk about how bad it could be. So let's talk about how pessimistic this could be. What's the low side? Marketing people, do you have any input? Is there a reason why we might be concerned about the success of this product? Sam, Joe, Bill, Sue, tell me about your experiences. Are there reasons why you would be concerned about introducing this particular product? What do I think? I'm not going to say anything yet. I want to understand what you think first. I would have that conversation. What we've done is we've started by exploring the boundaries rather than going immediately to what the most likely outcome would be. And now, at this point, we can start talking about most likely, at which point I'd probably bring in the data guy. And I'd say, hey, data guy, we've been talking about maybe as low as 20,000, maybe as high as 200,000. There's been a lot of discussion around this. We're not trying to reach any agreements right now. Um, data guy, what happened last time? What does your data projection say? 40,000? 80,000? Tell me about the data. And then after we started talking about the data, you know what the very first thing I would do after that is? I would say, okay, now I want everybody in here to think about what is similar to the world we're in right now compared to when we last took this data and what is different. And do we think that it's materially the same or do we need to set aside the data because it doesn't reflect the world we're in? And that's what I would do. And then the final outcome of this interestingly enough, is not to reach consensus around a single number after we've had that entire conversation. We've got one more step, and the step is, okay, everybody, you've heard the arguments. You've heard how it might be high. You've heard how it might be low. You've heard the data. We've talked about how the world is similar to and different from when the data was driven. Now, here's what I want everybody to do. I want everybody on their own individual piece of paper, without trying to reach consensus, I want you to write A, M, and B on your own little piece of paper. You can be influenced by what you've heard, but I don't want you to just take what other people have said. I want your own A, M, and B. Now think about the difference, all right? Think about what we've got now. In the past, we had all the flaws of groupthink, and we had a single number that could not distinguish between scenario A or scenario B. What do we have now? Well, now I've got 10, 15 pieces of paper. On each of those pieces of paper, I have an A, an M, and a B. I've tried to manage against groupthink. And what can I do with that A, M, and B? Well, let's take a couple of situations. Suppose when I look at those 15 different pieces of paper, on each of those papers, the A is not very different from the B, and all of the A's across all of the papers are pretty similar, and all of the B's across those papers are pretty similar. What that tells me is I more or less have scenario A. There's not a lot of difference between A and B, and the A's and B's are similar. There is reasonable consensus around the possible ranges that exist on that. That's useful information. I can now make decisions consistent with scenario A. On the other hand, if when I look at those 10 or 15 pieces of paper, I see a large difference between the A and the B on any given piece of paper, and the A's, the M's, and the B's are quite different between the pieces of paper, that's probably telling me that I am less confident around what the world looks like, and I'm probably going to have to make decisions consistent with scenario B rather than scenario A. That's the idea behind the Delphi beta technique. Get rid of groupthink as much as possible by the vehicle through which you do this, and then make sure you keep working ranges instead of single numbers by thinking in terms of A, M, and B rather than a single consensus number. Oh, and by the way, I often get asked this question. Well, if I want to come up with an overall range estimate and actually write down an A, an M, and a B, 
should I just take the average of all the A's, the average of all the M's, and the average of all the B's and call that good? And my answer to that is no. We're guessing the future, people. Guessing the future is always going to have a lot of uncertainty associated with it. And human judgment can be very powerful. Suppose you knew from that group of people sitting out there, you knew that some of the people were very good at looking at worst case situations, but were very poor at looking at the optimistic situations. They missed the breakthroughs. And other people were very good at breakthroughs, but they weren't very practical about the reality of the situations. Nowhere does it say that everybody's estimate for A, for M, and for B are equally valuable. You simply would use your own judgment, looking at what's coming from all these numbers, to finally come up with an A, an M, and a B. And it might be an A, I'm looking at those numbers we used earlier so I can try to use the same ones. Maybe the pessimistic side, A, is only 12,000 units. Maybe the optimistic side, B, is 180,000 units. And maybe the most likely outcome, what we think is most likely to happen, the mode of the distribution might be 30,000 sales. What we have is we have our best understanding of the possible ranges of sales, and we can make decisions accordingly. There is a way of turning this into mean and standard deviation so that we can use it in predictive models. And to keep this in mind, we're going to say the mean, if we have these numbers, is equal to A plus 4 times M plus B divided by 6. And we're going to say the standard deviation is B minus A over 6. And you'll see more of this in the future because this helps us to solve some of our problems. But the bottom line is if we go through that process we just talked about, we can distinguish between scenario A and distinguish between scenario B. We can even come up with some type of estimate against these numbers. And from these, we can actually do some analysis that will help us. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but you're just guessing, Britt. You're right. This is just guessing. But you know what? When we had that single number with consensus around power, eliminating outliers, everybody's agreeing to a single number, we were just guessing there, too. This is simply a structured guess of trying to understand the future that establishes some critical business criteria.